morning. Can we, uh, we'll have the pictures immediately. You don't need to, to see me, if that's okay. The picture is from Fukushima in Japan, and some of you probably saw it. And um, the child is being checked with a Geiger counter to see what, if any, dosage of radiation uh, she might have had from the accident. And a friend of mine in Japan contacted me a few days after this appeared in the press and said, you know, I actually know uh, the guy uh, involved in that team. And uh, I also know the person who was responsible for the planning process that led in 1954 to the Atomic Energy Act in Japan, which was the, um, the precursor to the building of the plants in Fukushima and other places. And the conversation that he'd had with this uh, planner, this engineer from MITI in the, in the government system was uh, how distraught he was because the argument at the time had been expensive, difficult, possible risks, but the kind of fundamental rhetoric that uh, got all the forces together to uh, implement this program was, we have to do this, the nuclear energy program, for the sake of our children and our grandchildren. And then, uh, this accident occurs, and that is one of the grandchildren. This was not the outcome that that man or his colleagues had intended. He was not an evil man. He was a very brilliant and competent person. But uh, a certain framework to do with energy and sustainability and the prosperity of the nation was uh, without question uh, the context in which they made the decision. And then the rest, so to speak, is history. And I want to tell you that little story by way of saying, well, here we are, a couple of generations later, uh, talking about what kind of transformation is it that we're trying to uh, start here in terms of the, the health of the nation, the health of our societies. And I think we just need to be a bit less careless this time round about the relationship between progress and innovation and energy, because we've seen in the past that the consequences can be unexpected and really quite painful. Um, because what happened uh, in Japan, and frankly, the modern project generally, um, I learned this wonderful word, what's it called, Coal, comorbidities, that's right from the, from the data session yesterday. We make decisions and we think about the kind of range of options that we're faced with on the basis of assumptions that, uh, and Jay talked about assumptions as well yesterday, Jay Parkinson, that we regard as axiomatic, but actually shape us um, and steer us in terribly damaging if not downright deadly directions. The first and the obvious one is the myth of limitless growth. Every politician, every policymaker, every banker, everybody says we must grow because otherwise, well, they never complete that sentence because nobody even asks for the explanation. The myth, secondly, that actions that we take on a tiny scale, on a large scale, um, if we're specialists, then it's not our job to think about the consequences, good or bad, in other uh, genres and uh, contexts. This is the whole kind of problem of the siloization of knowledge is that we do our little bit and somebody else looks after the bigger picture. And then thirdly, the kind of biggest grand narrative of all, the point of the whole modern project is about the total illusion that uh, we as human beings are in some way separate from and above the natural world rather than being part of it. So I give you this little kind of background about uh, kind of the strange ways in which we've got to where we are now because of assumptions that I think are now beginning to be questioned. Um, and to try and connect it to, here we are in this, to me, it's just quite intimidating and scary to be in one of the world's great centers of research and clinical excellence. It's had as a, a, a kind of reputation which is literally global. Very scary to come here. And everything I've been told and seen and heard about in the last two days has been quite admirable. But there are two things that I would uh, say have not been mentioned very out loud. The first is that this great, glorious machine runs entirely on fossil fuels, or to a very large extent in different respects. And secondly, um, in order for it to flourish as an organism, as a system, as a kind of community, uh, as an ecology, it has to grow. 
It, there is nobody I've heard saying, oh, well, we're planning to get smaller in the future. I haven't heard that sentence made, and if it has, I apologize. But I think that most people would uh, regard it as totally normal that a great institution like this would, would grow, because that's, that's what institutions do, right? Well, let's see. Um, as John mentioned at the beginning, uh, I wanted to kind of confront you with a kind of few local difficulties. So when you look on Google or anywhere else about health and environmental impact or health and energy impacts or health and energy intensity, what you get are lots and lots of references to people with their buildings and the different ways that they're trying to uh, make their buildings green and get LEED certified and there are projects on this uh, campus which are in that category. But the building, although a gigantic energy sucking monster that they can be, is only one relatively modest part of a bigger picture. There is the equipment in the building. And there are the consumables that flow through it. But even those, if you add them up to get a figure X, which is probably a horrendous energy performance, is only um, a small proportion of the bigger picture, which is the total uh, system energy performance, which a new branch of boffins are beginning to measure that. And that is anything from four times X upwards. I'm not going to give you real numbers. I don't know what the numbers are for here. But the point is that things that are taken for granted as being just normal part of daily life of a world-class center for uh, treating sick people are horribly um, vulnerable to any disruption in the flow of fossil fuel energy through the body medical. Uh, you've seen these lists about oil-dependent uh, consumables. Uh, maybe you haven't heard about the extent to which traffic and the transport intensity of modern societies is also health-related. A new UK study says something like 5% of vehicle movements in Britain can be uh, attributed to the medical system in one way or another. 5% of all, all vehicle movements. It's extraordinary. Not to speak of the greater world of the uh, so-called support industries and all the different people ranging from the manufacturers of Band-Aids to the uh, lobbyists uh, flying around in G5s. Those are all costs, activities, uh, energy consuming and energy demanding things without which it is assumed by each individual concerned the whole system would stop working. Of course, I'm, we are all, as we know, essential to the operation of the bigger picture. But the aggregate, when you add it all together, is a kind of gigantic it's not just 15% of the, the economy, it's 15, 20% of the total energy intensity of the whole picture. And we know, to come to the end of this uh, energy sapping moment, that uh, the United States, but all the so-called developed countries, have grown through the decades of the modern era, uh, and that the growth of their economy corresponds very uh, precisely to the energy intensity of their lifestyles. And the only small problem with this uh, story is that it coincides with the imminent decline in the availability of the energy without which we wouldn't be performing. Now, why is it that these effortlessly going upwards uh, economic growth and the about to go downwards energy availability don't get discussed more openly? I don't know. It's a strange pathology. By now, you're thinking, typical Duma paranoia and exaggeration. Don't mess up our jolly breakfast session. Take one of these. Or, John, take two of these. Uh, and you can absolutely, with some justification, regard me as a kind of crazed Duma type person. But I am not alone. This is Lloyd's of London, uh, the hub, or one of the major hubs of the financial system in the world, report that they brought out last year saying, in words of one syllable, an oil supply crunch is likely in the short to medium term. And if you think that Lloyd's is a bunch of banksters and Brits, which is a bad combination, how about this one from the Army of the United States? By 2012, surplus oil production capacity could entirely disappear. We simply aren't going to replace this with renewables. That is your Army high command. And it's not just about energy throughputs as a kind of immediate threat to this great, can you hear this roaring noise in here? That is energy being consumed just for us to sit here in this pleasant, cooled environment. It takes energy to obtain energy, drilling things, going under the sea, never mind the fracking stuff. And the energy to obtain energy actually has to be paid for by somebody. It costs money. Oh, dear. 
it costs money to get energy, and maybe the money is disappearing as well. This is one of my favorite websites called Bankers with Their Heads in Their Hands. If you ever feel you want to see the bastard suffering, I do recommend it. It's a very, very therapeutic uh, place to go early in the morning. And so you're confronted, or we are confronted with this un uncomfortable sort of convergence, which actually in many respects they're feeding on each other in ways that uh, a, I don't properly understand, and B, we don't have time to go into. So peak oil and peak money are clearly part of a kind of joint narrative. Uh, but there's one more peak uh, that we need to uh, mention, peak fat. Now, I spent the last two days uh, observing all sorts of uh, very fascinating uh, applications, treatments, strategies, metaphors to do with the management of obesity and diabetes and all this kind of family of horrendous things, 30% growth per year in this world and not so far behind in other countries. 40% of teenagers in Delhi are obese now. Maybe, could it be, and actually a pretty good idea, that the, the culture and the values of the institution here actually have a very good intuition that these big, black, monstrous machines are not the purpose or even the kind of real uh, point of this whole story. And is there some place between the, the road of death and the end of everything and everything being perfect that we can explore? And that brings me to propose as my uh, meal ticket for the breakfast session today, um, what we should be prepping for is a health system based on 5% of the resources that we have today. Okay, and that's the 5% comes from factor 20, uh, dividing up everything equally, what is actually likely to be available. It's not a kind of rhetorical device. It's a rather realistic, in my opinion, uh, number to describe what we will have to work with in the not too distant future. It's not a kind of a game, this. Impossible, you say. This is completely unserious. Go away. No, it's not impossible because 5% health already exists in certain parts of the world. Here is a 5% health environment. Now, who knows where this is? It's in Cuba. It is Havana, Cuba, where uh, they have, as you know, um, achieved uh, similar results. This is from Science Magazine, because this is one of the points where I know I'm going to get absolutely hammered without some kind of evidence. So Science said last year, and it's one of a widely known story, the Cubans achieve the same level of health with only 5% of the health care expenditure of Americans. So there's Cuba on the left with a little red uh, triangle, and there's um, us in the US here on the right with the blue one. And how do the hell do they do that? Well, there's been an energy blockade. So if we want a sort of summary of my story about why I'm an optimistic doomer, is that uh, necessity is the mother of transformation. In Cuba, they had energy blockades, undeveloped economy, all sorts of kind of constraints on resource use. They could only and were only able to invest in primary care, in localized food production, clean drinking water. Um, they actually have a lot of doctors. They're kind of paid a tiny bit less than you, uh, 15 to $20 a month in most cases, but that's a kind of minor detail in the sense that their outcomes in terms of how long they live, uh, incidents of chronic disease, et cetera, et cetera, are not so different. And by the way, they don't have uh, sugar manufacturing companies to deliver superfoods. They grow it themselves in the city. But Cuba is a kind of communist nightmare special case. Don't use that as an example. Okay. Here's another example from my hometown in Northeast England. And it's about Alzheimer and dementia. Now, uh, the British government, like your government, is beginning to get seriously panic-struck about aging, not just in general, but about the consequences of the things that accompany aging, such as different kinds of dementia. 700,000 British citizens have some kind of dementia now, three million people involved in one way or another with looking after them. Question, oh my God, how will a government look after these poor people with dementia? Who knows what the answer to that is? It won't. It can't. The system of looking after people is broken. We've heard this said several times. There is no conceivable way that any government is going to be able to summon up the resources, let alone the kind of strategies and the, the frameworks to do this. So, question, are there practical steps to respond to this fact that the government is not going to look after people with dementia? What else can we do? 
And so the project that I was with, involved with in Northeast England starting in 2007, which is ongoing now, was a whole bunch of the activities that you've heard about over the last two days. Mapping opportunities to improve aspects of daily life, cultural probes, uh, co-creation labs. You've heard these words, and they're doing it on the 16th floor of one of the buildings around here, these amazing uh, group and the center, which is our host. And the outcomes of all these designerish activities with the citizens with dementia were insights. There are the post-it notes. You can't go to a design conference without post-it notes. And these were people with dementia and their carers, and a very, very well organized and thorough and professional and empathetic process to say, what are the things that bug you in your daily life? That's where the post-it notes come in. Secondly, which I think is the most powerful outcome of this whole activity, is a shared understanding of priorities. There's a million and one things that are a nightmare to do with having dementia in your daily life, but let's try and make an order of priorities. And from the people, we, those 700,000 people and the three million carers, the sample that we talk to, that the, what happens when you first hear about it is a real nightmare, and what happens when you're dying is a nightmare. Those are the two things by a big margin that that group said were causing them the most distress, and could we please look at that? And then thirdly, out of that kind of list of priorities, from their point of view came all sorts of opportunities to do services to meet those needs. And we ended up with a, a short list of three. You've heard these mentioned in other contexts. You know, a care concierge, a buddy system, an eBay for time. Uh, it's all online in different places if you'd like to hear more about that. The point being that we were able to focus and provide real benefit by working 100% with resources that already exist, namely the, the dozens, hundreds of different people, formally and informally, who already are working with people with dementia and their carers, but where it's very difficult to access them. It's a crisis. You're in a terrible state of uh, distress and disorganization. How are you supposed to know what to do first or who can help? That's where you need a service called a concierge service or a guide to help you at that moment make sense of resources, i.e. people that already exist. OK, I'm galloping through here because I've only got 20 minutes, but I wanted to show it's not just Cuba, it's not um, just uh, Northeast England. All over the world, there are millions of examples of people looking after their health and other people's help without any cost at all. And so the lessons that we learned, number one of uh, this experience is that health and well-being are properties of a social ecological context. They are not something that you deliver like a pizza. I think that the language thing is very powerful in shaping our expectations. So delivery of health is a production line metaphor. You have a factory like this, and from it you make health in some way, and then you deliver it to people who then pay you for it, or in some way or another um, are happy recipients of this uh, thing. That, I think, is one of the reasons why we're in trouble, because of this production line mental model of delivering health to other people. It's not. We have to think about health is part of a context in which human beings and nature exist in good or bad relationships with each other. Secondly, a huge revelation, 95% of care today of people with dementia and in many other respects happens outside the medical system. It's already happening. It's people who are not paid, not qualified. What's that word? Not credentialed. Lovely medical word, that. Primary care, maternal care, all that stuff all over the world. People are busy looking after each other in ways that are not written down either in medical accounts or in the economy, as but they're doing it anyway. Thirdly, big problem for traditional economics that time-intensive activities are a virtue. It's good to spend time with each other because that's what people respond to most. Trust and co-presence, people being with each other, is as important as delivering something to somebody. I'm being a tiny bit rhetorical here, but I do think it's important. There was a brilliant study about Mayo Clinic finding out about patient satisfaction, and if a doctor sat down on the bed that people would be more happy with their treatment overall than if the doctor just stood at the end of the bed with a clipboard. It's that kind of stuff. Fourthly, 
It's not about intervening in communities, which is the subject of our session and why I'm absolutely confident that my story is going to hopefully introduce my colleagues later on. Intervening in communities is a bit like this production-like model of delivery. You go and intervene, like you intervene in Iraq or a schoolyard brawl. That's the wrong metaphor again. Communities need to be nurtured and supported and helped. And it's about being in them, not about doing things to them. The social energy is already out there, so all over the world people are doing stuff. Their social economy is the health economy. We don't have to create it. We just have to help it do better. Take the service to the people. Heck, take the people to the people. You heard Jay's kind of rather sad story about what a tough time he had doing something very simple, like being available to meet patients face to face in Brooklyn. There is a problem with the system, but the system is slowly kind of loosening up. This book on the left is brilliant if you want to write, read about Cuba and Venezuela. And on the right is the kimchi uh, kind of gourmet trucks which are transforming the food system in the West Coast. There's lots of interesting stuff happening. We don't have to start from scratch. So to conclude, 5% health already exists. It runs on metabolic energy rather than on fossil fuel energy. And um, so three quarters of the problems that sounded so grim at the beginning are actually solved already. We just have to kind of reframe our mental reference a bit. But it was, Rebecca said yesterday, that really brilliant presentation. And as John mentioned just now, strategy, all this stuff about, you know, brilliant ideas, very good. What the hell are you supposed to do upon leaving this conference? Uh, what practical steps can be taken? Well, and Lorna Ross said yesterday, we need a compass rather than a map. And I think it's a brilliant metaphor because the compass is the, it's not about knowing the answers. I don't know what the answers are. But on this great journey, where it's not towards a massive energy guzzling health center, but somewhere we know not what, my concluding, uh, and I hope optimistic note, is that there are people out there in transition from lousy situations to more hopeful ones all over the world. Absolutely everywhere you go, it is happening. They are in transition from food systems that don't work, from urban contexts that don't work from growing food in cities that doesn't work. Everywhere you go, people are busy today uh, trying to figure out not lists of to-do lists and also borders priorities. There's a fantastic amount of positive energy. They, I think, can be your friends and your partners in this journey. Set the compass to find me people who and groups who are in transition now and take me to them, and they can be my friends and my partners. Go and find them. And I think that will begin to unlock this otherwise very tough seeming challenge that we all face. Thank you.